I'm very excited about this piece of content. This is probably my first financial piece of content. And the reason why is my friend Damon Chenault in Wyoming, he convinced me to start making financial content. Now, I don't think I'm in the greatest financial situation of all time, but I think I'm in a really good one. And so because I think I'm in a good one, I think a good one can help people who are in a bad one, if that makes sense. Now, I'm no financial advisor, so disclaimer, I'm not giving you financial advice. I'm simply sharing with you my own story and a tactic that I've used since 2010, 2011, that has helped me build my own financial independence and my financial freedom. Now, I feel financially free. I feel financially independent today. And if you want to feel that too, some of the tips in this podcast may help you. Now, full disclosure, it says how to save your first thousand dollars, five realistic steps. Full disclosure, everything I'm telling you is something I've done. This is not stuff I've read in a book. This is not something I've talked to some financial advisor about, which I have spoken to financial advisors about my own financial situation. What I'm sharing with you is simply what I've done. I'm sharing a story with you. I'm sharing the ideas I had. I'm also sharing where my mind was at at different points in life to help you see where I am now. And the purpose of this is not this is not about me. I want you to have an emergency fund. I want you to have money saved up so when things happen, you're okay. You're not stressing out. I I care about you having money. See, a lot of the times when you're dealing with people who are talking about personal development, they don't always talk about money. And I'm one of those people. I haven't felt comfortable talking about money until my friend convinced me that this is something I need to start talking about. We need to start talking about this because it ties into mental health. It ties into personal development. And, and that's what I care about. So let's dive right in. I was reading online that 73% of Americans live check to check. According to Bankrate's latest financial security index survey, 34% of American households experience a major unexpected expense over the past year. However, only 39% of survey respondents said they would be able to cover a $1,000 setback using their savings. A similar 2016 Goal Banking Rate survey found that 69% of Americans had less than $1,000 in total in savings. And 34% had no savings at all. If you are an American who has less than $1,000 in savings, which according to Go Banking Rate Survey, 69% of Americans had less than a thousand in savings, and 34% had no savings at all. If you find yourself in that situation, this is for you. I will help you. And I'm not selling you anything in this. I'm literally telling you what I did. Emergencies happen all the time. The, the logical thing to do is to build an emergency fund to cover expenses when unexpected events happen. Radiators blow on cars, computers corrupt and stop working, appliances that you use every single day stop working. And on a deeper level, we get sick. We get rushed to the emergency room. We have personal injury accidents. When events happen in life, it can feel overwhelming. It can feel like there's just so much going on. Like I'm just overwhelmed. Having an emergency fund can help reduce stress. It can solve the problems that you may have and can give you more peace of mind as you navigate life. I am not a financial advisor, so I can't really give you financial advice. However, I can share my story and how I was able to save my first thousand dollars into my emergency fund, and then how I was able to build from there. The very first time I had a thousand dollars in my saving account, 
savings account was 2011 when I was in my first full year of working full time. Now, let's travel in time. Let's use our little free your energy time machine. And let's go back to what I was doing, what I was thinking, what I was desiring, what I was going through. Okay? Ready? Time machine. Activate. On three, two, one. Five realistic steps. Number one, I didn't want to be broke anymore. <clears throat> now, these are the five realistic steps that I took. The very first one is I didn't want to be broke anymore. I believe that there is a difference between poor and broke. For me, being broke just means that maybe I'm lazy or maybe I'm not using opportunity or maybe I'm not aligning myself properly. Being broke means that I have a chance to change, that I can become successful, that I can create the financial landscape that I deserve. Now, being poor, well, I feel like being poor is a little different because I feel like poor is, happens because of a situation outside of your control. Sometimes you live in a poor country, and so you just you don't have access to certain things. Or maybe you come from a poor family. When I think of poor, I think that you know things are set up against you. Or even if they're not against you, they're not necessarily for you. That's just me when I think of poor. I feel like if you live in America, being poor... Is reflective to your choices and your mindset. And, and we have to understand that those two terms have totally different descriptions and definitions based on who you are, and what, you're, what you come from, what your country has access to, what you're comparing it to. I haven't traveled the entire world, but I've, been tra I've traveled around. I've, I've left my country. I've traveled to what is considered third world third world countries. I've seen poor. I've seen I've seen poor. And, and it's so funny too because I'm I'm envisioning a poor family I met in Costa Rica, but they didn't they didn't seem poor. And if you're a spiritual person, you understand what I'm saying. They were poor financially. They didn't have shoes. They didn't have refrigerators. They didn't have running water. But they didn't seem poor. Poor. Right. So the context of this podcast episode is obviously we're talking financially. So they were poor financially, but they weren't poor spiritually. You get me. You get what I'm saying. Honestly, this may be controversial to some people, but I think a lot of people deserve to be broke. And the reason why I say they deserve, let me give you the context. The reason why they deserve to be broke is because their choices and their behavior warrant that. That's it. I'm not saying that I, I want them to suffer or I believe that they deserve to suffer because I don't. And you know, if you know my content, you know that. I don't believe that. I don't want anyone to suffer, actually. But if the stove is on and you see the red eye, or maybe you have one of those fire ovens and you see the, the fire, you see the actual flame. And you are a conscious adult, right? You, have, you are a conscious adult and you see that fire. And you reach your hand on that fire to see if it's hot. Well, guess what? You deserve that pain. I mean, come on. And, and that's, that's what I mean by that. Like your decision to put your hand in fire, come on, man, don't be stupid. You deserve that pain for being stupid. And that is what I had to tell myself back then. I'm being stupid with money. 2009, 2010. This is when I started making a little bit of money. I'm being stupid with my money. I had to be honest with myself. I had to be real with myself. I had to be accountable. Sly, stop being stupid with your money. I was tired of making poor decisions with money. I was tired of working check to check. It felt like hell to work all the time and never have money because I was addicted to spending. And for what real reason? 
I reached a point where I was just pissed off at myself and I wanted to change my financial future. For me, the very first step was a mindset change. My mindset changed to, I don't want to be broke anymore. I never felt poor. I felt broke. I was broke. I don't want to be broke anymore. I feel like that's a song. I don't want to be broke anymore. <laughs> I know my podcast listeners are like, man, this dude is crazy. But I love listening to him. <laughs> right? Step number two. Step number two. To get your first thousand dollars in the bank account, man, you gotta secure consistent income, man. You gotta get the bag, as they say. I know this sounds stupid and silly, but you will never save up a thousand or ten thousand or a million if you don't have consistent income. Is there the one off inheritance or lottery winner? Of course. But for most of us, we need consistent income. In 2010, I made a decision to stop playing arena football and to shift towards more full-time work. The $350 a game we were making was no longer enough for me at that point. Um, I was a young 20-something. I was chasing the NFL dream. You know, I played arena football for three years after college. Uh, it was fun, traveled around, met a bunch of people, but no. So what I started doing was I started working at a bar, started working at a restaurant, uh, it was a fun experience. I would do it again. If the opportunity, like literally right now, if the opportunity came to work in a restaurant, I would do it right now. Now, I have my career. I, I literally have a career. I'm a best-selling author. I travel around. I speak to people. Uh, I do YouTube. I do podcasts. I create content. I write, I write blogs. You know, I'm a conscious content creator full-time. But I will work part-time in a restaurant right now if the right situation came. You know what, I, like, I actually liked working in the restaurant. I really liked it. I really liked it. It gave me, it gave, it gave me a sense that I get from doing this work where it was very rewarding to feel like I was adding value to people. And I like that. Um, I also like getting tips every day. I like getting paid every day. That's a, I think it's a, um, I think in my sub, my subconscious, I like the aspect of getting paid often, especially like getting tips, because I feel like you're getting a reward that day versus, you know, sometimes your check, you're not getting paid until like three weeks later because, you know, you got to get the pay cycles. So you'll get paid like three weeks later for work you did like three weeks ago. And it's just kind of like, eh, it's such a delayed thing. Well, when you get tips, you make $100 a day. It's just like, well, Man, like, it was worth it today. I busted my ass today. Customers were on me. You know, my cooks were late. But, man, I made 100 bucks or I made 300 Like, you never know. You might see best-selling author Sylvester McNutt working in one of your bars or one of your restaurants. Shoot. Maybe maybe one of you, one of my listeners in Arizona, maybe you guys got a hookup for me. I, but, look, I can only work two days a week now. <laughs> I, look, I can only work, like, two days a week. I got a lot going on. Okay. When I was working at the restaurant, I was saving my tips every single night in a plastic sandwich bag. You know you ghetto. <laughs> you ghetto. I was broke. Me and my girlfriend at the time, did. we did not want to live together. But she had actually got kicked out of the house. She was a Jehovah's Witness and she was dating me. So she got this fellowship because she was uh, dating me. So they kicked, they literally kicked her out of the house. They stopped talking to her. They told her she was worthless because she was dating someone who's not a Jehovah's Witness. Which, that's a whole nother podcast that we need to talk about. For me, I was fresh out of college. We were just young 20-somethings trying to find our way in the world. So we ended up moving in together. Not because our relationship was advanced. Not because we were mature enough. Not because we thought it was a forever thing. But because we literally needed to survive. And we saw each other as a means to help each other survive. We were young, early 20, broke kids. I'm fresh out of college. She's fresh out of getting kicked out of the house. I mean, we're working at restaurants and bars. We're not making a lot of money. We're younger, dumber, you know. We needed to share bills and be roommates. So in order for us to survive, we found a place, a cheap place. I think it was like 600 bucks a month. Um, at this point, now it was in the country too. Like it was in Rockford, Illinois. It was just... 
At this point, we had no savings. There were no vacations, no shopping, nothing extra at this point in my life. When I was at this job and in this position, I was still focused on my long-term financial success. I was always focused on getting out of this situation, establishing some type of security. Saving money every night in a plastic bag is not the key to financial success, but it actually worked for me because I was able to save about $150 like that. Eventually, I turned that into a fully funded emergency fund. Now, for context, a great day of work for me would have been like 60 to 75 bucks at the time. The restaurant was not doing well financially. It was closing and the manager let me know on the side that I should look for a new job. I was lucky enough to find uh, a new career within a week of searching. Now, 60 to 75 was like great. There would be days I would just make like 20. It's because we didn't have a lot of customers coming in and our ticket prices weren't that high. So our tips really weren't that great. The corporate, uh, the corporate big wigs instructed all the managers not to tell the employees that the restaurant was closing. And I was lucky that I had a good manager uh, who I had a good connection with and she let me know so I could search for a new job. So I started searching for a job. It took me about a week. And I literally found a new career within a week. It was one of those things, you know, we always talk about alignment. It was one of those things where my life aligned for me to be in that job. It was just a perfect alignment. There was no other way it would have happened. Um, I actually don't like that the corporate bigwigs did, instructed the managers not to tell anyone because... You know, that's part of my distrust with, with corporate America right there. Like, you literally have 30 or 40 people working, and I get that you don't want disgruntled people. I get that you don't want people walking out on you. But you have 40 people who are going to be displaced. Only the managers are going to get a severance package, which is like three managers. They're going to get a severance package. Everybody else is going to be displaced. And it's crazy to me that, you know, it went down like that, and they did that. And the managers told select people that they trusted and that they knew were in financial situations that they needed money, which was all of us. So they told some of us, um, and all of us needed the money. Now, when I started the new corporate job, my income increased, my value increased. What I was able to save and make increased. I went from making tips every night to a salary of $30,000 plus the ability to earn monthly commission check upwards of, uh, well, minimum of about $1,300, upwards maximum of around $5,500. So I literally went from $20, $30 a night, maybe $75 a night if it was a good night, to now I'm on a $30,000 salary. That, like, that, that was so much money to me at the time. $30,000 was like so much and maybe you're listening and 30,000 is a lot to you and that's fine that's the thing money is all about perspective when they offered me the $30,000 contract I just put my hands up I was like yep right signing right here no longer saving money in plastic bags yep no yep no more yep I'll be honest with you and I don't I don't have any shame in admitting this we were so broke that me and my girl, we got on uh, food stamps. Uh, I, think she, I think she ordered them in her name. I don't think I ever had them in my name. She ordered them in her name, and we had food from the government for like three months. And I don't feel bad about being on food stamps because we were both working. We were trying to work. We were trying to, we weren't comfortable with our situation either. We're out here applying for jobs. We're out here trying to move up in life, move on in life. We're not living frivolously, you know, buying mink coats and like we didn't buy anything. We didn't have cable. We didn't like we literally didn't do anything. Uh, we could we couldn't even afford to go on dates. You know, we would we would cook for each other. We would go for walks. We would just you know like I said, we were rich. In here, not here. We were in here. We were rich. So we did that. Um, I gotta send her this podcast. This is dope. This is a cool experience. Actually, reliving this and, and, and having the nostalgia and going back. and This is pretty cool. So when they say, hey, we're going to give you $30,000, I say, okay. When you need me to start? <laughs> Plus, I get commission, $1,300 minimum, upwards of fifty-five. What? 
Oh, I'm in there. I'm, I'm giving this job everything I, I got. All right. So ne number three, the next, the next, the next thing is you gotta have a plan for money. No money or a little money. You gotta have a plan for the money. Have a plan for more money. Whatever it is, whatever you're doing. No money, little money, more money, little money, extra money, <laughs> chicken chalupa money, whatever you're, <laughs> whatever it is, you got to have a plan. This is why most people fail when it comes to money. There is no plan, no blueprint, no structure. People just do what feels good. People buy things based on emotion. We buy things that make us feel good, look good, and experience the good life. But if, if this is the habit that's causing you to be broke, well, then something has to change. I hit seventy thousand dollars in debt. I didn't have an emergency fund. I don't have that that debt now because I paid it off because that was my plan to pay off my student loans. Going to college was a big financial mistake in my opinion. I don't feel like I obtained any job, any opportunity, or any success because of my college education. That's just me. I feel like all of my personal success has been. Uh, due to my behavior, my networking, the lessons I've learned from people in life, and things that I have taught myself, studied myself. Now, I probably sound like a hypocrite because my profession is a writer and a speaker. I studied that in college. I did learn a lot in college. I took speaking classes that taught me how to speak, that taught me how to breathe, which is why it seems like I can talk forever because I understand how to grab my breath. Like right there, I grab my breath. See, that is a professional tactic. See that? I learned that in college. I took writing classes that taught me how to write. Now, I didn't do well at them, but they taught me. <laughs> Now, I'm trying to be objective and fair, and I truly do not feel like my college education was worth $70,000. I feel like it was worth something, but I feel like $70,000 was a little bit too much, and I feel like it was inflated. You get you get what I'm saying? It was a valuable education, but it just was it just cost too much. Either way, I went, I'm here. The debt is paid off. They got their money back. I got my education, and now you guys get me. So, hey, it worked out. When I was working at my restaurant job, my only real plan for money was to eventually get a job that paid me more money. Once I got the job that paid me more money, my plan changed. Then my plan became, hey, I want to be debt free by the age of 35 and I want to have a million dollars cash in the bank. I believe I was 23 or 24 when I set that target. You know, I feel like a lot of Americans um, have the... I need a million dollars saved up and that equates to financial freedom. I feel like a lot of Americans have that and uh, that's not it. I actually, I actually don't think that's the financial freedom. Now that I've been doing this for eight years, uh, I, now that I've been working on my financial plan for eight, nine years, I can tell you that the goal of having a million dollars is not what gives you freedom. What gives you freedom financially is your behaviors and your mindset towards money. Uh, it's not about the numbers. It's really about what you value. It's, it's so funny that when people talk about money, especially conscious people, you know, aware people, when they talk about money, they, they kind of shame money. They're like, oh, I don't need money. You know, money doesn't define me. Money doesn't make you a good person. Money doesn't make you happy. Like, I get all of that. But if I'm going to have stress in life, I'm going to have problems in life. First, I want the skills to manage and deal with the stress. And if I'm going to have money problems, I want the skills to create, manifest, and to hold money so I can alleviate my problems. Just like I'm sure you want. Because I feel we are all worthy of that. Just because you are a conscious being... That does not mean to me that it, and you don't want money or you don't see the value in it. That doesn't make you better than another conscious being who says, hey, you know what? I want to be financially secure. I want to be able to take care of my family. I don't see anything wrong with that. Do you? Comment below. Let me know. Do you? In fact, I would argue... To me, now, this is just my, look, this is just my mindset. You don't have to agree with me. I've never been a woman. 
I've only been a man, right? I've only been a man. And I know that times are changing. And I understand that. But look, inside of my DNA, inside of how I've been programmed through years and years of evolution and conditioning, it naturally feels like it is my duty to protect the woman that I'm with. I have always felt this way instinct, instinctively. Money is not the key to success. Money is not the key to finding the right woman. But it does feel good to know that if something was to happen, my kid would be okay. That my woman wouldn't be struggling to take care of my kid if something was to happen to me. That's a good feeling. That's a good feeling to me. I don't care what people say about money. If you think money is bad, you won't have any. It will avoid you. You can and you should develop a healthy relationship with money. You can secure the bag. You can get your money. Money doesn't have to define you. Your clothes don't have to define you. You don't have to be materialistic. You don't have to be shallow. But you can take care of your mental health. You can take care of the stability of your family tree by making sure that you are financially dependent. Financi I'm sorry. Financially smart. Financially aware. That's what I meant to say. The number does not give you freedom. The behaviors you have towards money gives you freedom. What you value gives you freedom. You need to create a plan for your money. And you have to understand that as you move through each phase of life, your plan will be different. At the phase I'm telling you about, I started paying off my student loans. And then I was stupid. And I did something stupid. I bought a car, a 2011 car. I got a car note, which is stupid. Don't get a car note. Let me tell you why. My car note was $451.20. My insurance was well over $122. I believe the interest rate was like 25% interest. Why? Because I'm young, dumb, had no money to put down, and made a dumb financial decision. If I could go back in time, I would have taken two months worth of car payments and I would have bought a bike. I would have bought me an $800 bike. That's how I would have got to work. If you're trying to get out of debt, you're trying to save money, then in my opinion, getting rid of your payments is the first step. My life got so much harder when I decided to sign my name on that paper and allocate $600 a month to liability like that. You do the math. $600 a month multiplied by eight years. Do that math. $600 a month multiplied by eight years. If that was in a savings account invested in a company like Instagram or in a mutual fund, how much would I have right now? If you just did the bare math, $600 times 12 months equals $7,200. Over an eight year period, that's $57,600. And that would be if I just put it in a savings account with no interest. Now, I know the financial person out there is going to say, well, the inflation, you know, so it's actually going to be a little bit less. OK, if it's fifty four thousand dollars, I'm still happy. I didn't know that then, but I do now. And now I will never have a car note again in my life. If you're trying to get your emergency fund going, you need to examine the payments that you make each month. If there's a service you're not using, cancel it. There is no reason to pay for services, things, and merchandise that you do not need, that you do not use. Just canceling streaming services, silly memberships that you don't actually need could save you another $150 a month. And again, I challenge you to do the long time math. Once I started really being consistent with paying off my debt, getting rid of my payments, that's when I started being able to really develop my emergency fund. 
after you see this, I challenge you to think about every monthly expense you take on. And ask, should this go towards my emergency fund? Should this go towards savings? Or should this money go to this company? And what are they really providing? Are they really providing me value? Now, the fourth tip. You got to use a written budget. I made an account on Mint.com back in 2011. I've used it every single month since then. I check it every single week. It gives me a report card on my spending habits. It marks the month as once the month ends it marks the month as green or red and to me that motivates me because i want every single month to end green ending green means that you spent less than what went out this was important to me because i knew that in order for a, a business to stay operating you know they need to make more money and keep more money than they send out each month each year i knew that the same thing would apply for me so i want you to start looking at yourself as a business are you in the green or are you in the red Personally, I wasn't given any education on uh, finances. This is all just, you know, what I learned from my own experience. My family never talked about it. I don't know what my mother and father made. I don't know how much they kept. I have no idea. So what I challenge you to do, download a budgeting app. We all use our cell phones. Download a budgeting app. Put it on your phone. Uh, there's one called Every Dollar. There's one called Mint.com. None of these people sponsor me. They're just things I know about, there's a couple of them. Find a, I think there's even a budgeting app through some of the bank apps now, like through your actual where you bank. So find uh, a budgeting app, put your, put, put, your, put your information in there, and budget weekly. Now, if you're old school and you want to write it down, do that too. I mean, whatever you got to do so you can have awareness of your financial situation every single day. What's going out and what's coming in. That's really what you got to monitor. Now, my fifth point, my favorite point, don't forget this. If you've made it this far in the podcast, you're going to get a lot of value here. This idea is old as dirt. I didn't create this idea. I can't take credit for it. I searched the internet to see if I could find who, you know, who originated this idea, and I could not. The principle is simple. When you get paid, have a set amount go to your account. It's called paying yourself first. Pay yourself first. Now, this is something I've done since 2011. I pay myself first. Before you pay any other bills, before you pay rent, before you pay anybody, you want to develop the habit of you paying. Like, you're the one going to work, so you need to get paid first. Does that make sense? Your account needs to get paid first. Before you pay Nike's account, before you pay Lululemon's account, pay your account first. I have done this since I started my working career. There have been times where things were great and I was contributing 60% of my earnings to my savings. There have been times where things have been bad and I was only saving 5 to 10%. Also, when you're paying yourself first, you have to understand that this is the long game. This is about patience. Patience will get you far in life. If you do not have patience with the process, good luck. Because this is a process and it works. With your next paycheck, your next payout, your chip, your, your check, your tips, your royalty, your salary, your commission check, or even if you get a gift as a payment, pay yourself for it first. Doing this is like building a house, in my opinion. You lay the foundation, then you lay the bricks, and once the house is all set, then you can start thinking about what fancy lights you want to put on and how you want the bushes to look. Before you can dress up the fancy stuff, and do all the fancy stuff in life, you got to start by just paying yourself first every single time. I'm a living testament that it works. You know, now I'll save 30 to 60% of whatever I make that week or that month. You know, making content about money is a little intrusive to me because there's a certain amount of information that I have to share and that I have to give out. I have saved uh, over a thousand dollars in my emergency fund going back to 2011 there hasn't been a time uh no you know what from 2011 to 2014 i, I had my emergency fund great um but then what happened was i, I ended up quitting my job in 2000 and 2013 i quit my job so from 13 to 14 i was just trying to get what I'm doing now is trying to get it off the ground. So I, I lived off of my emergency fund. So my emergency fund went from like, hey, here to whoop. 
But because I was able to build my emergency fund up, I built it up to about $30,000. And then I used all of it to live, to fund my books, to fund my talks, to fund, you know, people finding me, you know, because um, I started being a full time content creator in 2013 when I quit my job. So, yeah, I was able to save about 30000 from 2010 when I started working, July 2010, till I quit my job, December 2013. When I quit my job, I had like 30000 saved up. And then with the 30000 I had saved up, I lived off of that for like a year and a half um, until I was able to, you know, get my books going full time. Once I got my books going full time and people were really just, you know, feeling my content and everything I was doing, then the money started coming back in, but that was almost like two years later. That was almost like 2015, really. It, you know, I was making money from what I was doing, but you know, I didn't. The my first book, The Accelerated, was not a bestseller. It was The Dear Queen Journey, which came out in 2014. That was a bestseller. That came out uh, February of 2014, and then I followed it up with Dear Soul, I believe, in November, and then. Um, 2016 I dropped a book, then 2017 I dropped Lust for Life, then 2018 I dropped Care Package, and then now 2019 I'm dropping the Free Your Energy book. And so for me, for my career, it um, you know, I'm successful, but if I didn't do this if I didn't do this tactic, I wouldn't have been able to quit my job. And if I didn't quit my job, I wouldn't have I never would have took myself serious. I would have never did this full time. So essentially what I'm telling you right now changed my life. I was able to save up $30,000 doing this from my job. So when people say stuff like, you know, you need to, I told you what I was making at that job. I, my salary was $30,000 plus commission. I made sure I maxed out my commission. I was top 1%. I killed it. I killed it in sales. If you guys need me to make you a sales video, uh, a video on how to be successful in your job, I can do that. You just got to tell me to do it. Tell me to do it. I'll do it for you. I was top 1%, maxed out my commission, I'm saving all my money. No, nah, that's not true. I, I blew a lot of the money. But then when I realized I had my goals, that's when I was like, okay, I need to save this. I need to save, I need to save. When I knew I was going to quit my job, when I knew I was going to get, you know, be all about my books and my talks and everything, psh, man, I was focused. I was focused. I was focused, man. So, yeah, making financial content is intrusive because kind of have to from a credibility standpoint you kind of have to share where you are in your journey and you have to do that so the other person can kind of can, can basically judge you and they can say okay well I'm doing better than you so you know I don't really need to listen to you or hey you know what I'm really not doing better than you so listening to you might help me and I think it's I think if you're going to share financial advice is you kind of have to be vulnerable and let people know what's going on with you now uh, you know, I'm not a multimillionaire. I don't have a, a, a huge company. My company is me and the people I hire when I need them to work for me, you know? Like, that's my company. It's, it's me and a couple of contractors. I don't have some multi-billion dollar industry company. That's not what I have. But I'm financially secure. I'm financially independent. So maybe you, you hearing this, you can get something out of it because that's all I'm doing this for. I'm trying to help people out. So, if you want more financial content, I'm more than willing to try. I have investments, too. I could probably talk about that. But, again, I'm not an expert on that stuff. I'm just, I go see the expert. I sit down with the expert. And I'm like, hey, what do, what, do, what do we need to do here? What's going on? Talk to me. Um, I hope you guys got something out of this, man. This was actually a fun episode. This was different for me. This was a different type of content. This was a different type of value. And I hope I explained things well. I hope that you, you got what you needed. Now, before I go, I am speaking live. You need to come on out. I'll be in San Diego, Atlanta, Los Angeles, Chicago, Miami this summer. Starting June 2nd in San Diego. Go to sylvestermcnutt.net slash events and get your ticket. What's going to happen is... There's going to be people who are going to wait until the last day. And they're not going to get in because it's going to be sold out. Each room has capacity. Don't be the person who waits to the last day. Come get this value. Come get this good energy. We're going to talk about freeing your energy. Come on out. Come on out. Come on out. 
If you don't see the city you want, scream at me, yell at me, tell me where to go, tell me where I need to be, help me get there, help me find a venue, help me. If you're coming, promote it, talk about it on social media, let's create a good vibe, create that healthy, safe space for us to talk about freeing our energy. This is the Free Your Energy Podcast. You can find me on iTunes, Spotify, SoundCloud, YouTube. My Instagram and Twitter handle, which you should be following, are Sylvester McNutt. I'm also on Facebook. I don't really know who uses that anymore. Also on LinkedIn. Link up. Find me. Make sure you comment below, like, subscribe, share this with someone. Let me know what you thought about this episode. If it sucked, that's cool. That's amazing. I'm still going to use the tips because I use them. They work. If it was amazing, if it was life-changing, if it was great, let me know. If you got value out of it, let me know. And I'll see you very soon. Your energy is already free, my friend. But in case it's not, I command you to free your energy.